Muy buenas tardes. La charla hoy en español, ¿verdad? <laughs> That's how I test you all. Uh, does this sound loud or you, can you, is, is it uh, all right? Okay, first, I would like to thank also the Center for Regional Studies. I would like to thank Professor Crawford, uh, uh, as well as Professors Rees and Himmer for the invitation to be here uh, and for all organizing all the activities and for taking me around uh, and for Vasquez and Latigo for taking me around today as well. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, are we getting feedback? Or? Okay. Um, Fifteen years ago, I sincerely doubt we would be having a conversation about Venezuela at the U.S. Naval Academy or any other institution for that matter. Or any other institution for that matter. That's a simple reality. Even to this day, courses on Venezuela at major U.S. universities simply don't exist. They may be an add-on, but they are not dedicated courses to study in Venezuela. Why is that? Even when I went to graduate school at the University of California in San Diego, I was told, don't study Venezuela. No one cares. I study Mexico. Everyone cares. Um, and I did, because I wanted a job. Uh, so that there was some practicality to it. As a country, Venezuela did not seem to matter. The U.S. academic interest and security interests focused on the big countries of Latin America, Mexico and the ABC, Argentina, Brazil, and Chile. Uh, so you had Mexico, Argentina, Brazil, and Chile, and to this day they dominate the discourse in the academy on Latin America, whether it's in the American Historical Association or whether it's in the Latin American Studies Association or any other regional bodies. Um, that's a simple reality. So Venezuela. The northernmost country of South America, facing the Caribbean. Uh, I always use the map because I always think it's important to geographically situate ourselves. Uh, and I know not in this case here, but so many times people still have a hard time. When I first came to this country and I said I was from Venezuela, they said, oh, Venezuela, what part of Africa is that? Um, so it, the, the level of knowledge is not, is not, is not is something that we have to still grapple with. Even in the midst of the war in Nicaragua, when the National Geographic asked graduating high school seniors to place Nicaragua and Norway, half got them confused. Half got them confused. So I always want to start with understanding where Venezuela is at and its geopolitical significance. After 1958, Venezuela, a country that had been ruled largely by generals for most of the 20th century, became a model democracy promoted by the U.S. as an alternative to more radical developments occurring in Cuba. According to proponents of the model democracy thesis, prudent Venezuelan politicians established a power-sharing arrangement and purportedly used oil wealth to mitigate social and even racial tension. In fact, according to a U.S. business publication, quote, if there had been no perfect illustration of what U.S. technical and capital resources could do for the world's underdeveloped areas, it would have been necessary to invent the Republic of Venezuela, unquote. Writing about the 1983 presidential elections, the New York Times editorialized, democracy as usual in Venezuela. Quote, some events deserve notice because they are unremarkable. The democratic secession in Venezuela, for example. Among political, military, and business circles, Venezuela was known for its vast oil reserves. U.S. officials once described Venezuela as a glorified filling station. That wasn't meant for publication. That was an internal document of the National Security Council. The media seldom responded, uh, uh, reported on Venezuela, and none of the major newspapers had uh, offices in Caracas, and none of the wire services, not Reuters, not UPS, uh, not UPI, none of them had services in Caracas. With the election of Hugo Rafael Chavez Frias in 1998, that changes overnight. That dramatically changes overnight. From a relative obscurity to increased international recognition has made writing and talking about contemporary Venezuela a complicated task. A country that previously seldom registered on the world stage has for the past 15 years been the source of conflicting articles, mostly centered on the actions of its deceased former president, Rafael Chavez Fria. And informed by these media accounts and with little independent research, Many people seem to have already formed an opinion about Venezuela. One of the most con common ways that contemporary Venezuela is represented is to focus on its president, Hugo Chavez Frias. And this is a common depiction we see, a megalomaniac ruling over an oil-rich country. One of the most common ways that contemporary Venezuela is represented is to focus on the period before and after Chavez. 
For proponents of this distinctly ahistorical account, everything at, since the election of Chavez has been catastrophic. In fact, proponents of what I call the chaos school in Venezuela have been predicting economic and political collapse for the past 15 years. The last round was in February and March of this year when the opposition once again attempted to topple the government through street actions and the U.S. media took to compare in Venezuela to Ukraine or to Syria. The opposition for its part insists that the model is unsustainable, that oil will eventually drop in price, bringing the country to its knees, which has not happened, that they insist that the current debt is insurmountable when in fact it represents 53% of GDP and is in line with many of the countries. Even though Chavez and now Maduro were elected democratically and the country has had 19 elections by, observed by international observers, media accounts invariably will describe Venezuela as an authoritarian regime. The, country, the government is dictatorial, anti-American, a member of the Latin American axis of evil, or worse still, a supporter of international terrorism, linking it to uh, the, the U.S.'s uh, contemporary enemies, Hezbollah, Al-Qaeda, or FARC. And this is an example from a Tampa radio station uh, where it has uh, Ahmadinejad, uh, uh, Bin Laden, and Chavez in the same, in the same image. Uh, creating that kind of imagery uh, of this axis of evil uh, uh, pointed against the U.S. Uh, another common description for those who are unfamiliar with the contemporary histories of the region is to argue that somehow uh, Venezuela is working lock a step with uh, three amigos. And this is the axis of evil argument essentially portraying uh, Chavez and, and uh, uh, Castro as part of this axis of evil conspiring against the U.S. The axis is inter is, can be intertwined. Here we have what I call the three amigos, uh, Hugo Chavez, Fidel Castro, and another figure commonly known in Latin America, which is Evo Morales. Um, the three amigos are largely interchangeable, uh, so you can take out uh, Castro and Morales and add uh, Kirchner, the current president of uh, Argentina, or Lula, the past president of uh, Brazil. Um, and in many ways, this is, this is a, a, a very simplistic way of analyzing, of interpreting uh, what is happening in, in Venezuela or in Latin America. Um, and I'll leave the, the Pirates of the Caribbean up for a while. Um, as importantly as how Chavez and Venezuela are described is the proposition that before Chavez, Venezuela functioned efficiently. Harkening back to the model democracy theory, uh, the de democratic institutions, according to this argument, were supposed to be responsive to the people. The political and economic elites had not created a corrupt petrostate that benefited only a small minority. The country had an active agricultural sector, uh, and that's why it imported so much food. Oil profits were never squandered and were always uh, accounted for. Uh, dissent never faced repression. The separation of powers allowed for uh, checks and balances. Uh, I would be glad to point out that between 1968 and 1998, if there had existed an independent judiciary, every president would have been indicted uh, for corruption. Uh, or, or seven, the polarization did not exist and the racism did not influence the course of social relations. And poverty and equality, which by the way had reached 60%, uh, with extreme poverty reaching 28, uh, appeared not to be existent. So this is what the model democracy thesis would argue, that Venezuela before Chavez did not have these serious problems, and in fact they were exacerbated after Chavez. In fact, as early as 1974, the U.S. recognized that Venezuela faced extreme serious problems. In July of 1974, a National Security Council report concluded, quote, Venezuela is a nouveau rich country whose history of dictatorship and poverty was transformed by the emergence of the petroleum industry. The rapidity of this change, however, is often described as having outstripped the cultural progress of the nation. And it is frequently said that Venezuela's favored classes have jumped too quickly from, quote, the ox to the Cadillac to the jet plane, unquote. Uneven development has left other millions of Venezuelans living in untouched poverty with so slim a stake in the existing structure so as to make economic reform and income distribution imperative. This is the assessment of the National Security Council, not the assessment of some left-wing organization. But in 1974, the National Security Council recognized that there were serious problems in Venezuela. So as we can see from the NSC report, focusing on Chavez does little to reflect the difficult reality that most people confronted. It does little to explain why if conditions before 1998 were balanced, why on earth would people have voted for Hugo Chavez who promised who promised in his campaign to upend the political status quo, to draft a new constitution, and to recast relations with the U.S. 
<coughs> uh, I think the reason is exactly what the NSC report was that a majority of Venezuelans had no stake in the existing structure. That is why in 1998 Chavez won the election, an election that the media described as the contest between the beauty and the beast, because Chavez initially was running against uh, Miss Universe Irene Science, uh, who was also a mayor in Caracas and was also launching herself as a presidential candidate. So the 1998 election was described as the beauty and the beast. She didn't make it past the primary cycle. In the end, uh, Chavez actually won the election by uh, upwards of 54 percent uh, and became Venezuela's democratically elected president. It's quite customary to hear certain people say that Hugo Chavez was simply lucky winning the elections in 1998. After all, the price of oil went up when he got elected. Well, not quite. Uh, when Chavez was elected, the price of oil was six and seven dollars a barrel. Uh, and he had to personally reassert Venezuela's historic role in OPEC. You might want to understand that Venezuela is one of the founders of OPEC in 1960. Juan Pablo Perez Alfonso, the energy minister, actually traveled to Saudi Arabia, to Iraq, and to Iran, and actually uh, helped organize some of the first meetings that took place between the oil producers. And particularly in the case of Venezuela, they recognized that with the arrival of the Middle East, they would no longer have a monopoly on the sale of oil to the U.S. that they once had. Therefore, for them, OPEC was very important uh, in that context. So that in, in 19 1998, 1999, Chavez actually travels to the Middle East, to Saudi Arabia, to Iran, to Iraq, uh, to the region to actually try to stabilize the price of oil upwards of $30 a barrel. The rise past 100 is not Venezuela's uh, doing. In fact, that's the result of the futures markets and somebody speculating on the futures markets. By 2000, not long after the Constitution had been approved by voters, conservative forces that for the most part uh, had opposed Chavez and viewed Chavez as an aberration refused to accept the result of elections uh, and actually staged a coup in 2002. Uh, a coup that upended the political process, but a coup that also began an, op an opportunity for the government to, re to reclaim the oil industry uh, that had been in, in the hands of uh, PDVSA officials um, up until that time. Uh, so that we see, uh, here's an example of the coup uh, that many people say was uh, a mis now recognized as a mistake, and in fact we have uh, the, the, the cardinal from the Catholic Church signing on to the coup declaration with Mr. Carmona. So my take on this is all presidents should be this lucky, right? Start with $6 a barrel, have a coup against you, uh, and uh, at the same time uh, be reelected. Um, so this is the context in which Venezuela starts, and this is the context in which Venezuela begins to change relationships and begin to change perceptions uh, with the United States. As was previously the case with Cuba, Chile, or Nicaragua, for those concerned with simplistically dividing the world between friends and enemies, with the election of Hugo Chavez in Venezuela, uh, he was, the country was transformed from an ally, a model democracy, into an obstacle of Washington's plans for the hemisphere, especially the promotion of the free trade agreement. Um, this new adversarial, adversarial relationship has promoted a renewed interest in the country, and some scholars have begun to question the operating assumptions that existed about the country, its history, and society. This new scholarship offers a more nuanced view of the country's past and present. The mass media, however, continues to be drawn by the image of Hugo Chavez or drawn by the more radical process of change occurring in the country um, and has not been able to provide much clarity on the matter because when you focus simply on the figure of Chavez and you fail to look at conditions in the country uh, and particularly the role of oil, you're only capturing one element of this larger contradiction that's taking place. So after nearly 15 years of constant exposure, most people, even though the media reports on Venezuela with more f frequency, still don't have a, a clear understanding of the country, the social groups, its political parties, its society, or its culture. Rather than grapple with this complexity, popular discourse appears still drawn to the controversial figure of Hugo Chavez, its leadership, the opposition bloc that challenges the president. Seldom, however, do they actually attempt to move beyond the dueling forces and to understand the complex history. The election of Chavez was the result, I would argue, of profound dissatisfaction with the Venezuelan political system that proved incapable of dealing with the economic crisis, where inflation had topped in 1996 over 103%, where capital flight was rampant, and where political pacts permitted leaders, in many cases, to escape prosecution from corruption. A situation where banks and insurance companies had collapsed. Their directors had avoided prosecution, moving to Miami, where their assets were secure in offshore accounts. The popular discontent 
and the presence of organized social movements and not a southern lurch to the left led by a charismatic leader is what thrust Venezuela onto the international stage, recasting relations with the United States, with Latin America, and with the rest of the world. Chavez represents the first wave of many Latin American left leaders elected during the 1990s. Here is a picture of UNASUR, which didn't exist before 2008. UNASUR is the Union of South American Nations, a body promoted by uh, Hugo Chavez and many of the presidents of the region, and that brings together all the presidents of South America, irregardless of their political orientation. So you can have Mr. Santos right there from Colombia, who is a strong proponent of relations with the U.S. and is, uh, has a free trade agreement with, with the U.S., as well as having, uh, in that case, Mr. Pineda, who was then the president of Chile, or Pepe uh, Mujica, president of Uruguay, who has the opposite point of view, uh, or Rafael Correa, who has an opposite point of view. The point is, these are new institutions that are the result of the kind of political change we've seen uh, in the last 15 years, uh, many of them led initially by Venezuela. Oil. On the other hand, has also, I'm sorry, one more slide. Uh, the other important institution is the CELAC, the Community of Latin American and Caribbean Countries, which likewise joins all of the countries of Central America, the Caribbean, and South America into one body. Um, and uh, and it's, it includes also Cuba, as you can see, uh, Raul Castro sitting right here uh, in the meeting. Um, and this body, like UNASUR, does not include the U.S., which means essentially that the Organization of American States, the premier body through which the U.S. has essentially had influence in Latin America, has been largely marginalized, particularly since the 2009 coup in Honduras, and particularly since also the ouster of the president uh, in Paraguay. And instead, country, organizations like the CELAC and organizations like uh, UNASUR have taken uh, the lead in creating uh, the conditions for a new discourse in Latin America uh, that largely is independent of the U.S. To understand Venezuela is to understand oil. Oil has served as the nexus between Venezuela and the U.S. since its discovery in the 1920s. Um, since in the 1920s. Uh, the, <coughs> the U.S. and oil has been a central component of U.S. policy. In October of 1942, General Maxwell Andrews, the U.S. commander of the Caribbean Defense, uh, qu said, quote, I would rather have Venezuela as an ally in World War II than any other country in the hemisphere, end quote. Venezuela, he said, is strategically located with respect to the Panama Canal and has, as you can imagine, a bountiful supply of oil, unquote. Easy access to Venezuelan oil proved essential during World War II, and the U.S. developed elaborate plans to defend the Venezuelan oil fields, deploying military advisors, covertly placing FBI agents uh, in the country, mostly as legal attaches, setting up artillery posts along the coast, placing a squadron of bombers and fighters in Aruba off the coast, and destroyers uh, uh, in, in Trinidad, as well as coordinating with the U.S. oil companies, the government, and the military. Oil thus served to shape economic and political relations between the U.S. and Venezuela between, 1990, uh, between 1920 and 1990. And th therefore, thousands of U.S. residents lived and worked in Venezuela and forged a web of personal relationships that endure to this day. Accustomed to dealing with a country that operated firmly in what the CIA called the political orbit of the U.S., the Washington political establishment, uh, the media, and most academics in the U.S. appeared ill-prepared to deal with the dramatic changes that took place in Venezuela after 1998. Except with the connection to oil, most North Americans would have little reference point on Venezuela. If they have any, it might be Churung Meru. You might know it as Angel Falls for Jimmy Angel, the pilot who landed on top when his plane crashed. Um, it's the highest waterfall in the world. Um, Venezuela made no real effort because it had oil to promote its tourism. Uh, it, there really wasn't any effort to attract uh, American or European tourists to its warm beaches in the Caribbean, although it has extensive beaches. There was really no effort to attract uh, people in the U.S. or elsewhere to come and explore the Afro-Venezuelan legacy, although it is extensive. There was no effort to attract people to come see the indigenous of Venezuela and its heritage, like Mexico has done. Um, so therefore, there was really not any other connection uh, or visible connection, external connection, except for an occasional article in National Geographic that usually highlighted the beauty of the natural environment uh, and uh, its presence in, Latin, in Venezuela. 
Um, another traditional uh, point of reference uh, might have been immigration. But Venezuelan seldom immigrated to the U.S. In fact, the 19, uh, 2000 census in the U.S. underscores that 91,507 Venezuelans lived in the U.S. The 2010 census uh, uh, reported 215,000. Even accounting for undocumented immigration uh, and recent increases, Venezuela has over 30 million people, suggests that despite dramatic political changes, only a relatively small percentage of the population has actually migrated to the U.S. Uh, that's not to say that Venezuelan's elites have not migrated. There's a large presence of Venezuelans in South Florida, in Texas, and others, dating back to the 1950s, where in fact there was a tremendous uh, and important Venezuelan presence. Um, the other symbol might be Simón Bolívar. Uh, on occasion, the figure of Simón Bolívar um, has drawn attention uh, to the country. Bolívar proposed the creation of a supra-Latin American state uh, composed of the former colonies to balance the power between Latin America, Europe, and the U.S. His writings to this day continue to serve as inspiration for many in Venezuela on the right and the left, and continue to beguile both the right and the left uh, who seek to find some con uh, point of reference in Bolívar's uh, writing. Revered in Venezuela as El Libertador, uh, his legacy inspired proponents of social change in Venezuela long before Hugo Chavez appeared on the international stage. The other event that might draw your attention is baseball. Venezuelans are quite adept at baseball. Over 95 Venezuelan players are in the major leagues. Um, in fact, uh, uh, Miguel Cabrera, the Detroit Tigers third baseman, has been the most valuable player in 2012 and 2013. Um, and the, the other thing that might attract, uh, as, as you can see, uh, the Americans in Venezuela also played their version of baseball. This is an oil camp in Lake Maracaibo, uh, where uh, bored Americans uh, described to me in an interview that they played burro baseball, um, simply because they had nothing else to do. Um, the Venezuelan baseball team in the World, World League uh, has made it to the finals, but never actually won. Um, we are talking about that a few minutes ago. Um, the other thing you might know Venezuela for is the Miss Venezuela contest, uh, which is the only international contest uh, actually transmitted by Spanish language TV uh, on uh, US, uh, US channels. Um, and Venezuela has had the uh, uh, cult of beauty uh, imposed or superimposed on it um, and has won uh, over six different Miss Universe, 208, back to back, 209, and again in 2013. Some call it a beauty factory because these young women undergo tremendous amount of, uh, uh, should I say, uh, work uh, in the process of becoming beauty queens. Um, so that we have uh, points of reference by which you might be able to understand Venezuela. Um, the other, which has been more recently, has been the Sistema, El Sistema. Uh, some of you may have recognized Gustavo Dudamel, uh, the conductor of the Los Angeles Philharmonic, uh, and may recognize the term Sistema, which is a uh, musical program that was started in the 1970s, long before Chavez, uh, to take classical musical training to the barrios, to the poor neighborhoods, to empower young people, to train them in, in discipline, uh, and at the same time train them as musicians. Uh, and every city in Venezuela, every neighborhood has a component of a classical instrument a classical band, uh, an orchestra, uh, which makes it into the international arena, uh, and increasingly Venezuelan directors are now in Europe, the U.S., and elsewhere. However, despite all that, it's oil. It's oil that continues to draw attention to Venezuela, and it's oil that most is associated with Venezuela, uh, and it's the most identifiable image associated with Venezuela. This is the Barroso II uh, in La Rosa in 1922. It spewed over 100,000 barrels of oil a day. Uh, attracting the attention of over a hundred different oil companies that flock to Venezuela uh, to participate uh, in the oil economy. Since its discovery in, in, in well, earlier, 1914, but since the well of 1922, it has dominated the economy, and I argue in my book, The Enduring Legacy, it dominates the society as well, uh, and politics, cementing ties with the U.S. and creating expectations that oil would uplift Venezuela and promote modernization. Uh, <coughs> and that's part of the challenge concerning oil. Um, Venezuela was transformed in its relationship 
uh, with oil. It transformed its relationship with the world, with the U.S., with internal social forces, um, and it became the world's second leading exporter of oil uh, in 1928 and the first by 1935. Um, shortly thereafter, it also became a net importer of food, a condition that continues to beguile the economy to this day. Uh, that is that with the rise of the oil industry, um, we saw a declining agricultural sector continue its decline, uh, and Venezuela went, the oil industry went hand in hand with becoming uh, a, a major uh, importer of food. Uh, even though every president promised that they would use oil to, to promote agriculture, the reality is that people left the countryside because conditions of the city were much better than they would have been in, in the countryside. In the past decade, uh, Petróleos de Venezuela, PDVSA, has expanded operations in the Orinoco Basin where heavy crude deposits have increased uh, uh, its, con its confirmed reserves to over 296 million barrels of oil, uh, recoverable oil, and the U.S. government estimates over 513 uh, uh, billion barrels are, are possible uh, in the Orinoco Basin area, surpassing, quite surpassing Saudi Arabia, thus Venezuela becomes the primary uh, deposit of oil in the world. Uh, when Chavez assumed the presidency, the U.S. was the premier market for Venezuelan oil. The reality today is that China has now surpassed the U.S. Uh, and today Venezuela sells more oil to China than it does the U.S. Small, narrow figures, but close, close to it. Even though oil was nationalized in 1976, uh, the Venezuelan oil company, PDVSA, continued to operate as an international conglomerate and not a national enterprise. The Chavez government sought to correct this imbalance and, oil, and use oil resources to fund social programs. As importantly, before 1998, PDVSA had intentionally not included the Orinoco Basin Reserves as part of its OPEC-mandated output, thus subverting the very organization that they had created. Uh, in 1990s, foreign firms such as Exxon paid royalties based on a 1943 law so that they were extracting Orinoco Basin oil, heavy crude, no doubt, uh, but were paying it based upon rates as low as 16% uh, in terms of royalties. Those, that fundamentally changed with the rise of Chavez. It should be clear by now that control of Venezuela state implies control over the nation's purse strings, which overwhelmingly means oil and gas. Oil is analogous in Venezuela to a lubricant coating the various parts of an internal combustion engine, literally permeating every aspect of Venezuelan society in ways that are not apparent to the outsider. Long before Chavez's first electoral victory in 1998, the the key role of oil was evident in practically everything from the absurdly low prices Venezuelans pay for, for gasoline, one cent a liter. You can fill a tank with 55 cents US. You can have a Hummer in Venezuela, even though ecologically it may not be very smart, uh, but nonetheless, you could have it. Um, it oil also subsidizes uh, programs that reach every sector of society, including subsidized dollars for the private sector to import food, um, the various social programs, higher education, transportation for students, uh, university education is free, um, basic food products, um, and many Venezuelans consider the subsidies derived from oil as a birthright, as a birthright, um, and no government willing to stay in power has, up until now, challenged that assumption. The current government uh, initiated about two months ago a discussion about raising the price of gasoline to actually meet costs, to actually meet costs. Um, that discussion is ongoing. Uh, it has not uh, been uh, fulfilled yet. Though many consider oil a birthright, not all classes benefited equally from the profits derived from the petro state. The middle upper classes proved to be the principal beneficiaries. In the words of the Miami Herald, dur quote, during the oil boom of the 1970s, Venezuelans ran their big cars, American cars, at breakneck speed along Caracas' upper highways. They developed expensive tastes and a love affair with imports. Even the middle class began dreaming about owning a house in Miami. Um, so that for some middle-class Venezuelans, oil then became the conduit for, the, for a, a modern, in, uh, quote, uh, lifestyle, which meant an international lifestyle, which meant an image of being able to live in other areas. But the reality for, for most Venezuelans was not that. Venezuelans' middle and upper classes increasingly appeared to lose a connection to their immediate past. In the words of the Washington Post in 1977, quote, the middle classes are buying their way to the modern world, unquote. An example of this buying their way to the modern world was, quote, by conservative estimates, 
and totally unofficial estimates, tens of thousands of color television sets have been imported into Venezuela in the last three years, talking about 1970, and many carried by individuals through the Caracas International Airport. It doesn't matter the fact that Venezuela does not have a color television system, unquote. Uh, but it was important to have the color TV nonetheless. Um, what the Washington Post failed to understand was that buying their way into the modern world was only a reality for a very small sector of the population, um, and they lived in the shadow of the oil economy. The notion of oil as a birthright embodies a struggle over the allocation of state resources. Uh, and these resources that many consider a birthright continue to fuel the current struggle in Venezuela. By 1975, according to the New York Times, people in the barrios of Caracas, the poor neighborhoods of Caracas, were beginning to ask, quote, where has all the oil money gone, unquote. According to one nun who worked in the, among the poor, quote, we have seen nothing good from petrodollars, only the, rise of the the, only the rise in the price of milk, meat, and the rise in crime, unquote. These dueling perspectives, uh, inevitably heighten political tensions over control of the state, the social policies, and the perspectives that will determine the allocation and distribution of oil resources. Under Chavez, the government has uh, allocated 60% of its resources to social spending and reducing poverty, uh, providing health services, housing, education, community media, food, access, uh, and a host of other services. Uh, but this is the Caracas of the 1990s, um, and this is the Caracas of uh, where you see the, the skyscrape of Caracas coexisting side by side in the poor neighborhoods with the wealthier neighborhoods. What in Venezuela is called ranchos, what in Brazil is called favelas uh, and other countries. So you have this, 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 this image of two, co two countries, two Venezuelas coexisting side by side. Um, and in many ways, they continue to inform what uh, has happened in Venezuela. While there is scant knowledge about Venezuela in the U.S., there's extensive knowledge about the U.S. and Venezuela. Um, the, Venezuela the U.S. and its North American way of life, which includes a broad uh, exposure to U.S. consumer culture, fashions, music, sports, films, diet, and even the English language. I was talking earlier to some of your the, the professors here, and we're talking about how English language is used in Venezuela in every aspect uh, uh, as a social marker uh, and also in, in terms of, of uh, actual words. And I insist, as a result of this, without having to exercise any physical presence, the U.S. at many levels and the lifestyle it promotes functions as an internal constituent within Venezuela. That's important to underscore, that without having to exercise any in external influence, simply the U.S. lifestyle and the U.S. approach to the American way of life is in fact an internal constituent within the Venezuelan social political landscape. <coughs> this is the other Caracas I wanted to highlight. Uh, the Caracas of the barrios, the Caracas of the ranchos, the Caracas of the poor neighborhoods, uh, of the impro improvised neighborhoods that coexist face to face and share this urban environment and this urban space. Before Chavez entered the political landscape between 1958 and 1998, no leftist candidate in Venezuela had ever reached over 6% of the electoral vote. That is, between 1958 and 1998, there had been many elections and many left candidates, but none had reached higher than 6%. This underscores an investment in, a, in an economic and political system uh, that under, and underscores the extent to which that system uh, had, had, uh, root, had established deep roots in Venezuela. Um, <coughs> efforts by Chavez to promote a, his brand of 21st century socialism occur within a country where the prevailing values of a capitalist society have sunk deep roots. In a country that purports to promote socialism for the 21st century, the shopping malls are full. Um, the government social programs have dramatically reduced poverty, uh, and rates of, but rates of consumption of consumer goods have gone up significantly among all sectors of the population, um, as the population has increased from 23 million to 30 million. So poverty has gone down, rates of consumption have gone up, but that also means that expectations go up. Expectations in order to be able to fulfill uh, that continuous process. Um, Critics who point to increased imports fail to account for the fact that these goods now reach broader segments of the population. Rates of electrical consumption in Venezuela place it among the highest per capita consumers in Latin America. And Venezuela has one other distinction. With 42% of Venezuelans claiming to drink scotch whiskey, 
the 18-year-old variety. The country also has the highest per capita consumption of Scotch whiskey in Latin America. Um, a direct result of this oil economy and of this notion that you could coexist in, 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 the, in quotes, in this modern world and at the same time coexist in the other reality. Uh, so whereas, uh, again, these are the poor neighborhoods of Venezuela. The largest poor neighborhood in, in, in Latin America is not in Rio, it's not in Sao Paulo, it's in Petare, in Caracas. Um, and that's an example of Petare, not a tree in sight. Um, and again, that's the other reality. Um, and this is where, uh, up until recently, Chavez's support has come from, is these poor neighborhoods um, who see now uh, an investment in their social reality. Um, in keeping, even with this social reality, Twitter usage in Latin America is among the highest in Latin America. Chavez himself had over four million followers. His, his Twitter account, by the way, was Chavez Candanga, which means Chavez the devil. Uh, so in case uh, you, you had uh, seen that name before. Uh, per, capita inc per capita ownership of smartphones is among the highest in Latin America. And as I pointed out before, the American way of life and consumer practices had been conflated with social values and for some, even with their own identity. This way, <coughs> excuse me, um, to comprehend Venezuela political and social values, it is essential to consider the role of the oil industry in generating expectations for continued growth, for social mobility, broadly shared by many sectors. Venezuela's control of the industry after 1976 raised those same expectations I pointed out to previously, expectations that from these neighborhoods you would be able to move out. For many people, after 40 years, 50 years, that reality had become a nightmare. Um, <coughs> Venezuela's newfound prominence reflects the extent to which the country had managed, has managed to insert itself into regional and world affairs in little over a decade, influencing international debates on a wide range of topics. Much of what Venezuela proposed initially in 1998, including a nationalist energy policy, multipolar international relations, regional integration, food security, national sovereignty, now frame mainstream political discourse throughout South America. Much of his foreign policy initiatives, uh, which included, as I pointed out earlier, the UNASUR, the CELAC, um, and even uh, an organization called ALBA, uh, have now had developed deep roots in the region um, and have become uh, uh, institutionalized. And so have relationships between Latin America and African countries, Latin America and Asian countries, um, Latin America and Middle Eastern countries. And these meetings, these summits have been held in Rio, they've been held in Sao Paulo, they've been held in Caracas, um, and they speak to a new South-South set of relationships that are developing, that go beyond BRIC, uh, and that actually go to a more fundamental reorientation in what has been the development of South-South. Another important feature that Venezuela developed was called Petro Caribe, something that many in the opposition constantly criticize as an oil giveaway. The government argues that it, in fact, what it provides is oil on long-term credit needs, uh, on long-term credit basis uh, to regional members of the Caribbean and Central America, um, and continues to this day. It's interesting that the, the commander of the Southcom, General Kelly, said if Petro Caribe would collapse tomorrow, we would see a massive wave of migration coming to the U.S. as a result of the dislocation that it would cause in areas of Central America and the Caribbean. And that was said in uh, spring of 1994. Um, so it's interesting how institutions like that now have become so, so central uh, in the region. The so-called Chavez phenomenon, however captivating, is not necessarily the best way to understand contemporary Venezuela. While it would be relatively easy to divide Venezuela into periods that correspond to before and after Chavez uh, and his first electoral victory and adopt the media's fixation with Chavez, the actions of one person who, has been in, who was in power for 14 years do not do justice to the history of the country. Rather, I would suggest that it's oil and the elaboration of oil policy that provides a greater insight into the history and society of Venezuela. The discovery of oil in the first decades of the 20th century held out the promise of dramatic change, though in practice it did little to alter the structures of power uh, and the nature of economic relationships. As a major producer of oil within OPEC, Venezuela remains important to the U.S. and the countries of Latin America and the South. After more than a decade of social transformation, it is difficult to imagine a scenario under which Venezuela will ever revert to the two-party single policy of electoral democracy that the U.S. promoted within the region.
Despite depictions to the contrary, social movements and groups that support Chavez are not undiscerning masses blindly captivated by a charismatic leader. Neither did they vote for Chavez because they received free gifts, mostly in the forms of social mission that addressed everything from health care, housing, and other programs. Venezuelans are performance-driven voters. They voted for Chavez because their standard of living increased. They voted for Chavez because they were disassociated and had no stake in the previous existing system, as the NSC document underscores. They voted, however, this is not static. The opposition in 2012 did significantly better than it had previously. And its candidate in the October 2012 election actually won votes in Petare, uh, which was a, 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 a shot across the bow of the Chavistas. Um, and in fact, the uh, election of Nicolas Maduro in October of 2013 was the smallest margin we've ever seen of a Chavista candidate in the last 19 elections. Um, so that to, my, to my view, conditions politically in Venezuela have dramatically changed since the death of Chavez. His, his void is felt now, particularly in the context of the political polarization, so that the key figure that had been present and that was able to, in some ways, negotiate differences among his electoral uh, agenda and ar arena uh, have, uh, is no longer present. But likewise, the opposition candidate recognizes that he cannot win on simply a return to 1998 and, in fact, has promised to maintain the social programs, earning him the name Chavez Light. Uh, in the last election because uh, it was increasingly difficult to find out what differentiated him from uh, Chavez at many ways. To say that Venezuela is a polarized country is tantamount to a cliché. Politics has divided families, broken marriages, and strained friendships. However, to suggest that class and racial divisions did not exist in Venezuela before Chavez fails to recognize the deep social and racial fissures that previously existed throughout the country. Uh, notions of Venezuela's one big happy family before Chavez are at best illusory or at worst naive. Uh, what is clear though is that the appearance of Chavez on the political stage served to channel economic and social discontent that might as well, might previously have degenerated into open conflict as occurred in the Caracaso of 1998, a social rebellion that engulfed the capital and other cities in Venezuela. Uh, dealing Dueling political and social and even cultural visions fuel the current polarization. The election of Chavez and the dramatic changes after 1999 challenged deeply held individual and group assumptions about Venezuelan society, including politics, class and social relations, national identity, racial identity, and even Venezuela's place in the world. Upper and middle classes, long accustomed to a privileged relationship with the state and civic society, fear that the new political arrangement and social programs come at their expense. In reality, many of the new social programs are parallel structures, uh, and many sectors of the private sector have continued to benefit economically from nationalist economic policies. However, the conservative opposition's concerns are much deeper than simply politics or economics. Many sectors presume that oil permitted Venezuela to claim a distinct status within Latin America and considered it natural, uh, considered natural its relative isolation from the rest of Latin America. For many, the election of Chavez meant that Venezuela became everything they had attempted to negate, another Latin American country led by a swarthy looking, albeit charismatic ex-military leader uh, who promised to improve conditions for the poor uh, and people of color and invited them to become full-fledged citizens in his conception of the nation. Um, <coughs> political forces, some with a long history of social struggle and newly empowered, uh, have promoted the election of Hugo Chavez. It wasn't simply a lurch to the left. It wasn't simply an aberration. Uh, it has been sustained through 19 elections. Um, so that it's critical to understand that, to understand the current conditions in Venezuela, as it is in Bolivia, Ecuador, Brazil, or anywhere else. Um, generalizations, simplistic generalizations, tend to get uh, us nowhere very quickly. Um, as was previously the case with Cuba, Chile, and Nicaragua, Venezuela has been transformed from a friendly ally into an obstacle to Washington's plans in the hemisphere. <coughs> Venezuela 
was never, let me underscore, was never the purported model democracy uh, represented before 1998, nor is it today the professed model of socialism for the 21st century. The reality is more complex than that. Neither is it an authoritarian state where democracy has been vanquished or freedom of the press is non-existent, where the state controls all information, nor is it a repressive state where people fear a knock on their door and are disappeared as happened with military dictatorships uh, that Washington supported in South America during the 1970s. Representation of chaos, disorder, eminent collapse, economic meltdown, so common in the media, failed to capture the reality lived by most Venezuelans uh, and after 15 years sound relatively hollow. Rather, Venezuela is a Latin American country like, who, like all its neighbors, faces many serious social and economic challenges. It is impossible to predict what will happen in Venezuela next. What is clear, however, it is, that, is that the country will not go back to the conditions that existed before 1998. Thank you very much. I'd be glad to take questions, comments. I, I, end, I end with, with the oil tower in Lake Maracaibo blowing up uh, because I think that it sort of harkens to these different perspectives and the role that oil plays in the context of two Venezuelas.